Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the World Economic Forum here in Cape Town. My name is Chris Bishop. I'm the editor of CNBC Africa. I've been reporting from this continent for more than a quarter of a century, and today we're looking at the story of African growth. We're looking at uh, the story of the continental free trade area. We'll also be looking at the fourth industrial revolution as we pick up on our theme that we carried two years ago in Durban, which is Africa's economic update. Now, just to start off with, let me introduce my esteemed panel. To my left is Lesetje Kanyaho, the uh, South African Reserve Bank Governor. Uh, next to him is Oshola David Borha, the CEO of Standard Bank in Nigeria. And uh, at the far end is Albert Zufak, the uh, Chief Economist for Africa for the World Bank. And if I just ask my panel here, just a short statement at the start, where you think this continent is going economically, starting with Mr. Kanyaho. Well, the, the thing is about the outlook. Um, I think that what we have seen uh, for this year and for next year, the outlook is that uh, this continent will continue to grow faster than the world average. That's, uh, uh, that is the good news. Uh, but at the same time, there are, still, uh, there are still risks, and the risks have are been associated with uh, uh, deteriorating public finances and, um, and rising debt levels. Uh, some of the countries that had uh, received debt relief seem to uh, have piled up uh, debt once again. And uh, the difference this time, though, is that the debt is not official debt. It is debt that is held, in, uh, uh, is private, held by the private sector. And that, uh, that poses a challenge. But for as long as you have got improving growth prospects, and for as long as you are able to contain deficits, then the situation can, uh, the, the debt situation can be contained. Shola, how do you see it from a banking perspective? Well, we are positive. I mean, I moved out of my Nigerian role two years <coughs> ago, and I've been covering Africa, West, East, Central, and Southern Africa. And the one thing that we have seen, despite all the headwinds, is that there is still growth on the continent. And um, the convergence of technology, um, innovation, and various sectors of Greek energy is enabling us to find financing solutions to address client problems. And that is helping to drive growth on the continent. Mr. Zuvak, how do you say it? Uh, thank you, Chris. Well, from our perspective, you know, would a, uh, a recovery on the continent will remain fragile. Um, we still uh, see uh, uh, recovery in uh, non-commodities, uh, non-commodity exporters on the continent. Um, we still have, um, in uh, the year ahead, uh, five of the fastest, the 10 fastest growing economies being on the continent. And, and these include Ghana, for sure. These include uh, Ethiopia, Senegal, Cote d'Ivoire, among others, uh, Rwanda. Uh, those economies continue to power ahead, but um, the uh, uh, you know, risk to our macro outlook are mostly on the downside. And those risks include uh, at least three important factors. One is uh, the uh, growing trade tensions across the world that are threatening to lower uh, global growth. Uh, the, the second is volatility in commodity prices that will continue to uh, undermine growth in our largest economies. And uh, the third important uh, you know, risk I see uh, is, is certainly debt, as the governor has mentioned, but more importantly, I think uh, a fourth one I would add is the challenge of inclusion. And when I mean inclusion, I see jobs, I see opportunities, and uh, I see uh, sound fiscal policies. And let's just check in on the growth story. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa, we're talking about 3.5% roughly at the moment, two point, up on 2.3% 2018, expected to grow 4% in 2020. But for most economists on this continent, Mr. Uh, Kanyaho, that's, that's not enough. How can we get the elusive growth that every country seems to be searching for? Well, we will get it, but uh, just 
uh, an update on the figures to say that, by the way, if you remove South Africa and Nigeria from the figures, Sub-Saharan Africa is growing by an excess of 5%. Uh, and, and so what is dragging the average in Sub-Saharan Africa are the two largest uh, economies uh, on the continent. So the rest of the continent is actually, uh, is, is actually growing, uh, growing very strongly. I, how do we get the uh, elusive growth? I, I, I have got three, three propositions, um, uh, and they are no, they are no brainers. The, the first is that the continent has got to take advantage of the opportunities offered by globalization. And, and that means that Africa should actually be trading more uh, with, uh, uh, with the rest of the world. And of course, uh, it raises the issues of what the trade tensions uh, would actually mean for global demand. And we've got, to, we've got to engage with that. The second is that this Africa Free Trade uh, Agreement is a, is, a, is a big issue uh, uh, for us because African countries have not quite been trading uh, with each other. Uh, part of it had to do with what I would call uh, behind the border barriers uh, 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 to trade. And uh, that talks to the issues of um, moving the goods across the continent. Trading is one thing, but how is our logistics framework, how is our logistical system within the continent to, uh, to move the goods uh, uh, across the continent? Varying from everything from different rail gauges to how long it takes to move from one part of the African continent uh, to the other. Those are issues. So there are infrastructure bottlenecks, but that in itself offers an opportunity because dealing with those infrastructure bottlenecks and rolling out infrastructure could in itself be a source for growth. So taking advantage of the opportunities offered by globalization, trading more with each other, dealing with the infrastructure bottlenecks that uh, hinder uh, trade amongst African uh, nations. Sure, if we get straight to this issue, I mean, this continental free <coughs> trade area is been described very recently by the finance minister here in South Africa, Tito Mbueni, is like one of the biggest things that's ever going to affect this continent in the, in the century to come. So how much do you think it could change the game? I think it's a game changer. We're talking about, you know, 1.2 billion people on the continent, a combined GDP of $3.4 trillion. And the reality is that trade has been occurring informally on the continent. What the Continental Free Trade Agreement does is, first of all, it helps to formalize a lot of um, what is going on um, that is not recorded. It also helps to um, provide standards by which all the countries can be measured on. And moving the percentage of intra-Africa trade um, no matter how small, it's going to be huge progress. Like uh, Mr. Governor said, um, obviously we've, there are lots of challenges ahead. Um, infrastructure is one of them. But the exciting thing is if you think about the um, availability today of digital infrastructure, you've got AWS and Microsoft that are investing in the cloud on the continent. The ability to deploy um, innovative digital solutions you know, I think will enable intra-Africa trade. Afrexim is talking about putting in place a payments platform to enable trade. Um, so a combination of infrastructure, having the right payment platforms, being able to ride on the digital infrastructure that is being um, um, put in place, telecoms infrastructure, you know, is fairly well advanced in Africa. I think would help to enable growth. And um, obviously the financiers are, um, are here. Standard Bank is certainly well positioned to drive trade on the continent. Oh, but um, yeah. at the moment, Europe, inter-European inter trade 69%, Asia about 59%, Africa a mere 18%. Now the World Economic Forum hopes that by 2040, with the help of uh, possibly a continental free trade area, that this will double by 2040. How ambitious is that? Look, that's clearly ambitious, but not impossible. Um, but I think we, we need to all acknowledge and celebrate the fact that as the rest of the world is raising barriers and building walls 
Afri Africa has decided to embrace trade. And I think this is a great achievement, is the right decision, is the right uh, you know, move from our leaders. And I agree with uh, you know, Minister Tito, it is certainly one of the biggest uh, achievement of our African Union since its inception. Now, for it to really uh, become a force of economic transformation, we still need to work extremely hard. There are issues of, uh, you know, uh, uh, non-tariff barriers, as the governor mentioned. We need to build the infrastructure needed for trade, intra-African trade, to actually take place. But there is another very important dimension. I actually see two very important dimensions on which we need to be working extremely hard. The first is building intra-African value chain, you know, regional value chains. <clears throat> and that's where the jobs will come from. We need to actually you know, work extremely hard in allowing uh, a special distribution of activities across the continent, acknowledging that not a single country will be able to produce all the goods that they need. The second very important element we have to work hard about on is, is the free movement of people. And what has happened in the past week is not very reassuring. This is actually one of the uh, most important agenda moving forward, if free trade uh, the free trade agreement is to lead to an increase in intra-Africa trade. But let me just add one thing, uh, uh, Chris, on, on your question on, on how do we really ignite uh, higher or sustained growth. I think, you know, to really uh, solve that question, we need to uh, get to a deeper understanding of sources of growth on the continent. Yes, number of African countries are still growing very, very fast. But it is clear that our growth is very, very volatile. And the reason our growth is volatile is because our largest economies are, are all commodities dependent. So we need serious structural change. We need transformation in our economies, switching sources of growth from agriculture and mining and oil towards more service and manufacturing for countries that can still do it. So that structural transformation is needed. Mr. Kanyaho, um, one of the questions that people have about this continental free trade area is how it's going to work, particularly when it comes to payments and settlements for goods uh, across borders. Uh, but do you already have an idea of how it could work with existing infrastructure? Yes, we can. Uh, I, I think that it's all well to talk of a continental uh, payment system. Uh, but payment systems are run by central banks. Uh, we do not have a central bank yet uh, for the continent. So we must make and do with what we have. So there are three big payment systems, uh, regional payment systems on the continent. There is the East Africa payment system, there is the West African payment system, and there is the SADAC RTGS. The SADAC RTGS uh, by 2017 had cleared 3.7 trillion <coughs> rands uh, of uh, worth of transactions. It had cleared over 700,000 transactions and had more than 88 participating uh, banks. It's a basis. And whilst we are still dreaming of an, a continent-wide payment system, Let's do with what we have. And the, the conversation amongst us as central bankers is that we can get these three platforms to actually connect mm. and, uh, 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 and link with each other and build that as a, a basis for the settlement of trades. It's the infrastructure that is there, it's working, it's proven, and all that you need is to make sure that it is, uh, uh, it is uh, uh, connected. Yes, the SADAC RTGS is by far the biggest, I mean, it clears more transactions than all the other two put, uh, uh, put together, um, but we can, uh, we, can connect, we can connect this system. And we'll, we will be commencing with the pilot towards the end of this year. It's a race to the top. Uh, it's uh, which two will connect faster than the other, rather than trying to wait and get all three connected at the same time. Shola, I've got a question for you. Um, <clears throat> How long, you're assessing the situation, how long do you think it might take 
for this uh, continental free trade area to be, to be born, bearing in mind it took Europe half a century and still it's not quite uh, the uh, trading area that they hoped for. Um, there's a lot of paperwork to be done. Um, some, pe some of the reports I'm reading saying maybe decades, but what do you think? I think, you know, it's a journey. And um, it took 13 months, you know, for the um, agreement to be um, signed up by 54 countries. They've crossed the 22 country mark for ratification. And July 2020 is the effective takeoff date. So it's a journey and you would find that um, different countries are different states of readiness in terms of making sure that they begin to phase out their tariffs, um, they improve um, ability to get visas. In East Africa, for instance, you know, uh, you don't need visas to move around um, as, as, as well as um, in West and, and SADC. So um, it's going to be a race. Um, those who prepare early, I believe, would be the winners. And um, it's a journey that we would continue to track. And I'm hopeful that the AU um, would have clear metrics um, by which they can track progress and, more importantly, hold themselves accountable to. <clears throat> Albert, I mean, uh, one of the, the promises of this free trade area is uh, free movement of goods and skills and services. Laudable, surely, but isn't there a problem sometimes with these trading blocks that the best people can be sucked into the biggest economies with the most money? Isn't that a danger for the continent as a whole? Chris, um, my sense, my sense is, you know, um, free movement of skills comes with free movement of people. So the first thing, or the next agenda from my perspective for the EU, for the EU is to implement the passport they've been talking about. I think that's the first step if we are really serious in implementing this agenda because, you know, as, as we move to uh, the digital economy, as we move to, uh, you know, as we move to, uh, uh, to, to, to implementing this uh, disagreement, we cannot think of an economy based in services that does not allow free movement of people. I think this is the most important, uh, you know, uh, point. Now, um, will that lead to uh, people moving and concentrating to uh, different countries? Very likely. But if we are thinking Africa instead of thinking countries, mm -hmm. which is the principle under which we have embarked on this journey, then this shouldn't be such a worry. The worry would be, are we as Africa claiming a bigger share of world trade, yes or no? Are we as African actually trading more within the continent? Are we actually creating the kind of value chains within the continents that will generate the millions and millions of jobs needed by our youth and our women, our girls. I think these are the questions. I mean, Shola, if I could come back to you quickly, um, a lot of people I've been talking to here at the World Economic Forum say this isn't the time for nationalism, this isn't the time for economic nationalism. It's laudable. To me, that's the hope of the world, but I don't know. How likely is it you think that there can be this joint political will to see through this very important move in the economics of this uh, continent? Well, we've seen the political will to actually get the agreement ratified. I think um, what we need to see more on the continent is better economic governance. And I'm hoping that, you know, as the um, governments come together, as they understand the implications of bringing down barriers, driving intra-Africa trade, that our ability um, to improve economic governance to strengthen our institutions, um, we will have the political will to put that in place. And uh, uh, Mr. Kenyako, so th there's a lot of paperwork to be done yet, uh, putting things in place, measures in place. What do you think is going to be the greatest challenge, you think, for this uh, continental free trade area? Uh, I'm yet to think of challenges. Uh, I would like to think of the opportunities uh, uh, it offers, and uh, as we uh, take advantage of the opportunities, we will figure out what uh, the challenges are. The one thing that we uh, need to uh, bring to the fore is that there is a lot of talk of uh, countries trading with each other. 
And that is the problem that you would have with the balance on the panel. But if private companies that are trading with each other, they just happen to be coming from particular mm. uh, countries. And so coming to grips with what the challenges are going to be means that there has got to be a conversation that involves African companies that are doing trade with other companies on the African continent to say to them, tell us what are the barriers that you are facing and what is it that uh, you would like, uh, you would like uh, 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 cleared. That is, uh, 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 that is one thing. The second thing is that uh, there is a lot that we are going to have uh, to have to deal with here. It's, uh, African uh, Continental Trade Agreement. How do we deal with uh, trade? As I said, the continent must trade with the rest uh, of the world. There are going to be people with not such cool um, intentions uh, who would want to take advantage of these things. So setting down the ground rules is going to, next, to be the next uh, uh, important thing to look, uh, uh, to look at. And uh, the point, though, is that uh, the people who set the rules uh, are the ones who are elected by the public, not the kind of panel <laughs> that you have here. But uh, Shola, again, from the finance side of it, one of the big um, gaps that need to be filled is this transport infrastructure. Too many countries in the past, they had a railway to the port, and that was it. We now need infrastructure for, across all African countries. Private-public partnerships are being seen as the way out. How do you see it? Absolutely. I mean, SDG 17 is partnerships to achieve the goals. And the reality is that the public sector does not have sufficient capital to deliver the infrastructure that is required on the continent. We know where debt levels are. That therefore means that there has to be collaboration with commercial banks, with DFIs, with export credit agencies, with philanthropic organizations, with venture capitalists, equity providers. And the only way you can get all these stakeholders working together is when you have um, a clear regulatory and legal framework. Um, you must have governance that is transparent. Um, one of the best examples I, I like to refer to is the South African, um, the Renewable Independent Power Procurement um, Process, the office, whereby they publicly stated their renewable plan over the next five to 10 years. There was transparency in terms of the licensing bids. And therefore, the private sector had the confidence to invest in renewable energy. About $14 billion has come in through that um, program. And that's a model that can be replicated. So clear rules, a governance structure, and bringing all the different parties together is how we will be able to attract the much needed capital. And the point about um, having conversations, private sector, <coughs> public sector, is so critical because the concerns of each of the stakeholders, how the risks are going to be shared, is important. It has to be a sustainable project. The tariffs have to be cost reflective. You know? So those are the conversations that have to be had. And you then put in place um, a platform by which these funds can come in. Albert, how do you yeah. see the, the flow of investment here? I mean, because one of the, the, the fascinating promises of this is that you can invest in one country and have access to, uh, you know, 50 odd others. I mean, like, like in Europe, uh, how do you think that could reignite capital flows into this continent? I, I believe, you know, the you know, free trade agreement will certainly boost investment on the continent. And I believe it's, uh, it's gonna be uh, really helpful in boosting public-private partnerships. And I, th I think it's so important because by some estimations, Africa needs more than $90, 90 billion dollars per year for investment. And if you factor in public investment and, uh, and, 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 and current uh, uh, provisions of, of uh, resources, we st we're still left with $48 billion gap in infrastructure. 
And just to give you an order of magnitude, the whole World Bank uh, uh, IDA window, which is the concessional window for the, 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 the poorest countries, has mobilized $45 billion for Africa for three years, and that has been the record. Which means if we invested the, the whole IDA resources in one year, it wouldn't even be enough to close the financing gap for infrastructure in Africa. So, so it, is, it is crucial for us to actually you know, work extremely hard to bring in those, uh, you know, those, those public-private partnerships, bring in private finance in infrastructure. But what is also important to notice, Chris, is this is still a very small market in Africa. We have four countries in Africa that represent more than 48% of all the PPPs. It's South Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, and Uganda. 48% of all PPPs. So the market is still extremely small, and it is my belief that the implementation of the Continental Free Trade Agreement will boost those uh, uh, private funds into infrastructure. I know the infrastructure gap is one of the uh, things you've spent a lot of time studying, uh, Mr. Kudyako. But what do you think the answer is? Do you think it's public-private partnerships? Uh, it's not uh, one answer. You, you're going to need a commitment of, uh, of public resources. You will need the public-private uh, uh, partnerships. But you might also just want to open for the private sector to come and play in that, uh, uh, in that space. The point here is that if we think that we're going to close this, I mean, uh, sure, we will take advantage of the IDA resources. Uh, that is not going to be uh, the big game changer. No. The, the, the big resources are in the, uh, in the private sector. Mm -hmm. And what we should be thinking about is how do we mobilize private sector resources, not just from the African continent. You've got to be of asking ourselves the question, what is our value proposition to hold us of capital from elsewhere in the world that we could actually be attracting that capital uh, into our, uh, our projects? And that, for me, if you change the conversation and start framing the conversation by saying, look, we understand this thing that there are these gaps, but the answer is not going to come from just the official resources. The official resources can go this far, but we actually need to mobilize uh, private sector capital, not just local, but globally. Shola, also one of the other um, things that have been raised about this continental free trade area, that it will be a boon for small businesses, for entrepreneurs, it will help them attract investment and also help them to grow. Uh, how do you see that uh, panning out? I think Africa is primarily driven by small and medium enterprises, traders, small businesses. and. Um, Right now, you find they are constrained, very constrained. Access to affordable finance, um, logistics, moving their money around, moving their resources around. Um, we recently partnered with um, a fintech called Suna, Sumanini. And what they do is they provide um, financing to the small informal trader. They allow that small trader to stock up, um, to access credit, to get financing using mobile payments. Doesn't have to leave his shop, doesn't have to leave his outlet. And what all the regulators, all the policy makers should be focused on, especially on the back of the free trade agreement, is how do we enable these small entrepreneurs? How do we give them the financing they need? How do we make it easier for them to run their businesses? How do we enable the unemployed, the large youth population that we have to be able to start up businesses and to actually run with it? And with digital infrastructure in place, we are seeing it's easier for these young people, for these small businesses to grow on the back of telecommunications, on the back of um, access to financing that can be given digitally. So I think that the convergence of all of this will certainly help um, to drive Africa's growth and to enable the small and medium entrepreneurs to actually grow their businesses. Albert, if I could uh, put that question to you as an economist, uh, this massive youthful population growing up in this continent, great assets also if 
hands are left idle, it could also be a great threat to stability. As an economist, how would you approach getting the uh, continent to work through this free trade area? Uh, Chris, my office just produced a, uh, a book on the future of work in, in, in Africa. And I think, I think it is important to uh, highlight that, you know, having uh, a youthful continent is a huge opportunity, but a huge threat as well. It's a threat if we do not get that population to start really working. And the future of work it will have in Africa to have a digital content. And I think it's important to really emphasize the fact that the work of tomorrow is going to be driven by digital transformation. And we need to first invest in digital infrastructure that is actually lacking on the continent. We estimate that if Africa could just close its digital infrastructure gap, we could actually boost GDP on the continent by a factor of 2.5 percentage point. It is important to invest in digital infrastructure on the continent. So that's one. The second is investing in digital skills as well. And digital skills are not just engineering, coding skills. This starts from the education system at the lower level. It's about teaching all the soft skills, the collaboration, the teamwork skills, you know, which are not necessarily always present in our education system. So those digital skills are going to be absolutely critical. But the other important element on uh, making our youth more productive in Africa is to think of structural transformation moving out of subsistence agriculture. We have now uh, a report uh, at the World Bank showing that poverty is actually essentially, in Africa, essentially a subsistence agriculture problem. 80%, actually 83% to be precise, of our poor in sub-Saharan Africa live from subsistence agriculture. If we are to solve the problem of you know, em productive employment, we need to transform our agriculture. We need to move away from subsistence agriculture towards a, you know, agriculture that is actually, you know, more agribusiness than, than subsistence. And, and this, again, I see the potential for the continental free trade agreement to allow Africa to fit itself. Most of those subsistence farmers can grow if they have larger markets, if they can actually have the right infrastructure to access those markets across the continent. And that certainly, I hope, would happen. Which brings us smartly to our next uh, theme, the fourth industrial revolution, one of the big themes here at the World Economic Forum. So if I could come to you, um, I want to talk about exactly how it could change the game again. Um, just the other day, I was interviewing a gentleman from Angola here. and. Uh, he telling me a story uh, which I couldn't have believed when I first came to Angola in 1994 to report on the war. The country was virtually obliterated. He was saying that they're putting undersea cables so farmers in Brazil can control the irrigation of their crops in their fields in Angola, which is unbelievable. It's something that uh, I found amazing. How do you think this is going to come more and more into the world of economics and business here in Africa? Yeah, I think the fourth industrial revolution is going to disrupt all sectors. You know, that's clear. And, um, but it's also an opportunity. And I think Africa needs to take advantage of that opportunity. Um, we raised some financing for um, MCOPA Solar. It's a, it's a solar off-grid company um, run out of Kenya. And they've been able to connect 500,000 homes um, with off-grid solar panels, and um, you know the, the consumers pay as you go. Um, they are they've raised we raised 55 million dollars for them, and they intend to increase that um, to one million homes. You know, add another one million homes to that, and that is a combination of finance, um, technology, renewable energy, um, and they are achieving what. Um, it very easily what, um, you know, the large energy infrastructure projects um, haven't been able to achieve. So I think technological disruption is good in every single sector, and hopefully it will help us 
to better um, address and find solutions to the many problems we have on the continent. The fourth industrial revolution is upon us. What uh, changes do you see for good or ill? I take you to the words of Amina Mohammed, the Deputy Secretary General of the UN, who is here. She said, the picture has shadow as well as light when it comes to the fourth industrial revolution. How do you see it? I see a lot of light. Um, and the point here is that um, every big revolution that we have seen can look at the, uh, the previous ones and uh, say that um, the elements of the next one are always uh, getting seen in the previous one. And uh, I don't know, it would be a matter of time before we start talking about the fifth industrial revolution. There might be elements of it already uh, in the fourth industrial revolution. Well, one sees lots of opportunities, and I think that for uh, the continent, uh, the early aspects of it and the biggest, was the continent actually leapfrogged had actually been in financial, uh, in financial services. Uh, in many uh, uh, respects, um, <clears throat> Africa became a leader in um, um, uh, mobile payments and all of that stuff. And in those respects, I think the example that was given uh, earlier, you are going to see that kind of leapfrogging uh, 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 taking place. I think that the important thing for me is the conversations that we are going to have with labor and organized labor. Mm. Because many of them are in denial and they think that you, are, you can fight this in, uh, fourth uh, industrial revolution instead of asking uh, how do we embrace this and how do we engage with it, uh, with it differently. And for me, the way in which governments have got to think about it is to think about it like when you are doing a major structural reform a program that um, once as a whole we will be winners there are going to be uh, some losers and so when there are some losers how do you take care uh, of the losers because they could actually potentially cause uh, trouble and I want us to move from the logic that says that uh, which is the logic advanced by, uh, uh, by, by organized labor to say that you must protect jobs. We are already facing high, uh, high unemployment. Let us protect the jobs. You can't protect jobs. You can't protect jobs. It's just a wrong approach. We can protect people, mm. and that is what we should be focusing on, and saying that in the transition, as the fourth industrial revolution sets in, there are people, there are skills that are disappearing because they are no longer relevant. And what programs, what interventions do governments put in place to transition people from the old jobs to the new uh, skills in, in the fourth industrial revolution? And if our focus is going to be we must protect jobs, then we are going, we are going to fail. We can protect people, and that is what we need in order to make the transition. Well, if I come to you as an economist, I yes. mean, I think uh, Mr. Kenyaho is right. The unions, uh, the labor movement, sorry, is not likely to be very kind when it comes to the fourth industrial revolution. I was looking at some World Economic Forum research yesterday said for every job lost, 1.79 jobs will be created. I think, I don't know what 0.79 of a job is, but uh, I'm sure the labor movement is uh, not going to be that much. How do you see that playing out? Because as you know, it's very, very strong on this continent. That's right. Uh, Chris, the, the research we just completed and published in this uh, Future of Work is actually uh, pointing to the fact that there is more light than shadow. <laughs> in fact, in fact we, uh, we find that uh, you know, the fourth industrial revolution will create more jobs than it will destroy on the continent of Africa. And there are many reasons for that, and, and I may not get into all those details, but, but you should read the book for sure. Um, but, 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 you know, we do find that, um, you know, there are a couple of myths to dispel here. First is to think of that fourth industrial revolution as something that will come in the future. It's already here. Africa is already leapfrogging. And if you don't believe me, ask the people in the financial sector in Kenya, ask the people in the health sector in Rwanda and Ghana how the 
digital is disrupting the way people work, the way we deliver services, right? So it's already here and it's happening. Second myth is to think of that Ford Industrial Revolution as a sector as opposed to existing ones, as opposed to manufacturing or opposed to agricultural orders. It's in fact the case that digital transformation is a cross-cutting phenomenon that has the potential to raise productivity across sectors. So even if you are in agriculture and even if you are illiterate, digital transformation can actually increase your productivity. That's what we are finding. And we're doing a lot of research and a lot of work that's going to be, you know, again, published you know, in the next year. We are finding a lot of hope that digital transformation will create more jobs in Africa than it will destroy. But there is one concern, Chris. My biggest concern about uh, the digital transformation and the fourth industrial revolution in Africa is, is it going to be done without Africans? Or what role will African companies, African startup, African inventors play? To me, that's the biggest challenge. Well, Sola, I mean, we've been mentioned here in the financial sector, it's growing, it's fast. Just give us your take on it and, and how it is changing already our world. Yes, I mean, big disruption. And um, everybody is trying to get into the financial services sector. But, you know, it's a huge opportunity as well. And we are collaborating um, with our competitors, as well as competing with our competitors. We recently invested in Founders Factory Africa, which is an incubator accelerator for fintechs on the continent. And um, already there are fintechs who are devising solutions um, under Founders Factory Africa in Ghana, in Nigeria, in Uganda, in Kenya, you know, across the health sector, across education, um, and, and it's exciting. You go to Kenya and the whole ecosystem, um, they call it the Silicon Savannah, is, enables um, the growth of innovation and, and, and technology. So we, we think it's exciting. And, you know, there will be winners and losers, but ultimately efficiency is up, costs are lower, um, people experience greater value. Um, and, and therefore, I think that um, it's a momentum that is building. And the important thing is to make sure that, you know, as the convergence continues, um, the whole world really is going to be operating on platforms. And you have to get on that platform. Well, unfortunately, we've run out of time. But one last quick comment from yourself, uh, Mr. Kanyaho, on this fourth industrial revolution. I think that uh, one of the things that is understated is the impact that it would have on the efficiency with which uh, governments can deliver mm -hmm. public services. And I think that for me is a, it's a big issue. Mm -hmm. we, have a, we had a, a pilot project in South Africa that we called a Project Coca, where we used a blockchain technology in our payment uh, systems space. Uh, and the South African payment systems clears a couple of trillions of rents a day. And um, we were able to clear the amount of transactions that we clear for the whole day, we were able to clear them in 90 minutes. Now, think of the efficiency gains uh, from that and what it would actually mean. And this was in the wholesale market. But if we were to roll that out uh, across the country, think of the speed with which people could actually move money and the, risk, the reduced risk of uh, settlement in the payment space. Well, on that hopeful note, we close. Thank you very much to my esteemed guest, Lesetja Kanyaho, the governor of South Africa's Reserve Bank, Shola David Bohar, the CEO of the Standard Bank, and uh, Albert Zufak, the chief economist for Africa from the World Bank. And for me, Chris Bishop, the editor of CNBC Africa, it's thank you very much for watching and goodbye. <laughs>